Good evening. I'm very appreciate this opportunity to, uh, to uh, speak with you um, about a project we've been working on. So this is what you typically will experience um, when you live and travel in a major city um, in the United States or around the world. And this is also the problem that I've been dealing with uh, in the last 15 years. Um, so Louis mentioned I'm the faculty here in civil engineering department specializing in transportation engineering. Um, in the 15 years, um, I developed theories, models that actually help the government agency determine the best investment decisions in terms of taking your taxpayer dollars and deciding on what transportation project they are going to fund. Okay. Part of your taxpayer dollars, your gas tax, actually go to a centralized pool of funds that are managed by the government agencies. For many years, uh, particularly starting three years ago, I was called by a federal agency to deal with a particular problems. Um, is the I-70 corridor, mountain corridor, if you go ski, basically you know that that's the corridor west of Denver, uh, has the best famous ski resort, Vail, Cup Mountain, Aspen, all in the areas. From every Thanksgiving to March next year, over 15 weekends, uh, people go up, enjoy going up to the ski, enjoy their time Friday and Saturday, and then they'll decide to come back to Denver Sunday afternoon. Okay, 70,000 cars show up in that period of time, Sunday afternoon, and a 40 mile distance actually turned into four to seven hour travel. It has been a nightmare like that in the last 20 years, and it's hard to deal with that situation because it's a mountainous corridor. Mountain on one side, cliff on the other side, the entire I-70 is built on bridges. Uh, so anything you want to do, you talk about hundreds of millions of dollar investment, only to deal with 15 weekend problems. Um, so when you play a number, you look at benefit-cost ratio, it doesn't make sense. And, and basically, they call us up to help them evaluate a number of scenarios. And after that, we just realized that nothing works. Nothing to do with capacity, infrastructure, constructions, uh, would justify spending of that money. So we came back and said, it got to be some way to turn this around and rethink how we actually manage the traffic, partic particularly in that situation. The next video I'm going to show you is what kind of inspired me to think about how we can actually manage it differently. But Catherine is going to be the pacer for the cars. She's going to make sure that the cars only come on the highway as fast as we can make sure they flow through. So I'm the old highway, and Catherine is the new hi uh, highway. And amazingly enough, by the time we're all still stuck on the old highway, Every, we'll do it again, Catherine. Everybody can get, we can put twice as many people home in time. Okay, so what's happening here, right? The funnels are our highway systems. And the right hand side is what's happening nowadays. You pull the rides all together and everybody gets stuck. Now, if you can actually pace the speed at which rice is being poured, you can see that actually we can do much better. Nobody gets stuck. We can all through the same system and you don't need to build more. Now, it sounds great, and I, I use this video in my classes, and I show it to students, everybody love it. I say, okay, we can understand congestion now. The problem is it's much easier say than done to pace the speed of a rising poor, because it's you and me, we all decide when we want to leave. You know, we get into our car, we, we drive, and then only until when we got into traffic, we realize that it's oh, too late. So, <clears throat> now the concept is really about can we somehow change the way we to choose to lead, what time to lead, and which route to take. Actually, in the last 30 years, there's a, a number of different approach that have be actually been implemented. Now, think about flexible work schedules. Employers, government, in, sometimes encourage that. Couple lanes, that's where the facility dedicated for those who decide to couple. Um, when poor, the right share is really a, 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 incentive program somehow to help people to decide, you know, they can squeeze as many people into the same car as possible. But, but in the last 20 years, we have not been moving the needle fast enough. And that's why we still have congestion problem. Now, fast forward into 2000s, they are considered great ideas in terms of this. And maybe you soon you see it in, in your city. It's called electronic road pricing. That's basically charge you a specific fee into a certain area if that, during the congestion period, you actually pay a, a fee to get in, that's called congestion pricing. This is in Singapore, this is in London, you have to pay eight pounds 
during the daytime to get into a specific downtown core. And then this is actually called a congestion price in Toros. Uh, this is particularly California CA 91 in Los Angeles area. So Toro is getting everywhere. There are many good reasons why we may want to choose to charge the fee for people to use the facility during the rush hour. Basically, the idea is that if you use it, you pay for it, particularly you are the one producing the most externality costs, pollutions, congestions, during that peak time period. But there's a, there's a problem with this, and there's a controversial, ongoing controversy in terms of fairness. Those people may have to pay more, or it could be those who actually have no choices, that probably have to a relative lower income. So there's ongoing discussion about the fairness issue associated with this idea. And we still think about this. We never found a health, we never found the organizational behavior areas. That whenever you actually use stick and carrot at the same time, you actually achieve the best results. So look at the price, it's like a stick, all right? Stick on, you know, you know uh, basically you have to put, pay for using the facility during a rush hour. Now, can we sort of try some sort of carrot concept? And that's where we start to think about, maybe we can add new ideas into this concept and then complement each other. So you think about, hmm, okay, what does carrot mean? You start to think about, yeah, hmm, in the real world, this actually happened. When the airline overbooked their flights, what do they do? They offer vouchers, okay? Anybody want to get off the plane? And if three of us you know, decide to take the offer, get off the next plane and take the next flight, everybody's happy with all the problem. The cost for airline to pay for the three vouchers is way much lower than holding everybody. And actually, not only penalty, could be a potential penalty from the, the reg regulatory agency, but you just got the 200 very, very agonized, unhappy customers. Then if you go to Disney World, Disneyland, you see this, fast pass. What does that mean? Well, because the condition is so bad and there's a variety of different rides, so the idea is that you pull a ticket, it tells you that, hey, come back during this time period, the incentive give it to you, so now you can get into a fast pass. But this concept of scheduling here, you have to reserve your spot to get into user facilities. And they use that to actually balance the load of this entire facility. That sounds great. But how can we all link all this together in order to accomplish what we want to do in terms of a care idea? So we start to think about this concept. We first look at data. We take all the data for the entire city. We try to understand which corridor, which freeway started to get congested and from what time to what certain degree of severity. Different facility maybe get congested at different time. And that's what we do as a researcher. We analyze data. Then we develop the app. The app, so basically tell the, you know, the user is not putting in his origin destinations, we are able to present the user with this kind of information. If you are leaving at seven, the, the app is telling you that, okay, if you leave now, it takes 20 minutes. If you wait a little bit longer, 12 times, it's gonna be really, really bad. But if you are willing to wait even longer, actually you kind of wait out over that peak period. Um, that information is pretty powerful. Users say, hey, now I can make a good decision. I can decide to leave now, or I can wait out a little bit longer. Information is, is an incentive for me to make a choice. Second of all, I actually attach some sort of point to a different departure time, which means that if you are willing to leave earlier or a little bit later, I'm willing to give you points to reward you for making a choice. And, and if you leave during the peak rush hour, there's no reward. So this is entirely the incentive-driven type of approach. I'm not penalizing you. I'm offering you, try to make a deal with you that if you are willing to give up your seat for the freeways, and let other people who have no choice but have to leave now, actually you'll be rewarded for that. And actually, it actually benefit not only you, if today your schedule is flexible, go ahead and do it, you got rewarded for doing that. Those who cannot make that choice will also be benefited from you actually taking yourself out of the rush hours. Everybody wins. Now, of course, you have to do whatever you promise to do. So 10 minutes before your scheduled departure, there'll be a reminder sent to you pop out to your phone, and then you say, okay, John, ready to pack and go, and get into a car, you turn around and say, okay, set and go. Uh, the app turns itself into a navigation app. So it gives you a turn by turn navigation following the rule that you actually promised to take earlier. And somehow there's also, the, the GPS also validate, internally validate that you actually do it. Okay, you actually do it. So that actually, once you reach your destination following the route, the, the point that's been reserved for you will be deposited into your account. So we keep on doing this every day. You know, everybody's happy, but there's a fundamental question. It's, hmm, 
who is going to pay for the points? Or what's, what's the use of my point? Somebody has to pay for that. And that's the biggest economic problem. Who is going to pay for it? The point may have value to it. So that's why in the, in the last few two years, we have been getting, you know, be talking to agencies, cities. Um, they love the ideas. And actually, they say, hmm, um, there are a number of ways we can come up with a point. Uh, I can give out parking vouchers. Uh, we have zoo tickets. I have ball game tickets. Uh, I can call a dealer to donate a car for raffle drawings. And this is a great marketing opportunity for people to participate in this kind of green initiative. Um, there are a number of different ways we can get those incentives at the zero or low cost. Um, there are a lot of people tell us that they really love to donate a point to charities. So we find corporate sponsors to sponsor certain local projects. And if you choose not to use the point for yourself, you donate to a charity, once they reach that, the point to a certain level, the corporate will actually, will actually pay for that project. That's a crowdsourcing way of, of supporting our local school, local projects. So going back to, okay, we've been doing a very extensive study. Going back to the Denver project I showed you earlier. <coughs> there are four scenarios we're looking at at that time. One is to hire a locomotive, a company that actually will actually move the center, center barrier left and right to change the capacity you know, in both directions during the rush hours. Cost you $10 million. $20 million is actually to pay for, to, to thicken your shoulder, so actually during the rush hour, a car can start driving on the shoulder. So it kind of temporarily increases your capacity. $20 million. Then the other idea is actually to blow out the mountain again to make it three lanes, increase the capacity. Um, that's, that's really the bottleneck at this point, right? But it costs you $200 million. And that's another, another idea is why don't we just build a train all the way to the mountain? Uh, it costs you $2 billion. Like, keep in mind, we are solving a 15 weekend problem with that $2 billion. So guess what? We actually did a lot of analysis and looked into particularly um, this scenario. And we found, just to give you a sense of a of, of return for these our strategies. If I can convince one out of 10 people to take an offer and follow the recommendation we make, the travel time for the entire corridor will actually be less than this. So we are talking about asking the resort, don't kick everybody out during lunch you know, at noon, extend the checkout hours, give a little bit discount for the lift ticket, you know, come back and discount for the hotel, give them the coupon for the restaurants, and so people can hang out with friends, stay a little longer. That's the minimum cost. And by just simply by doing that without any construction, it's actually doing better than spending $20 million. To kind of give you an idea how effective it could be. And then we convinced the city to work with us. And we have been actually having a, through the city actually, we found several tens of users in the last six months. We've been, they've been actually taking the app and use it day in and day out, uh, give us positive feedback, and help us kind of understand many important things. In real life, does it really work? If you actually take my offer and leave it early a little later, do you really benefit from it? We have found that actually by doing so, they actually save 20% travel time. We discover a lot of new routes for them and they never used before because they just go with the route they are used to. And we they didn't realize that by, by changing the departure time, they actually can benefit quite a bit. So in the end, we, we found out that you know, when we started the project, we didn't know how many people are really willing to change their departure time. We're not quite sure. But from this, from, from this field testing, we found out only less than 40% of, of, of Gee, that's a nice hush, isn't it? I'm going, where's my second speaker? I wanted to do this, but you're already quiet. Um, so look, what I'd like to do is to welcome you today uh, to our discussion um, and to thank you for giving up your lunch hour and your afternoon to join us. I'd like to thank those people who are live streaming with us today as well who couldn't, couldn't get here. And I need to do a few COVID things because we are in the middle of a pandemic. So if you haven't checked in, can you please go and check in? Can you remain seated at all times? And when we finish at 2.15, we'll need you to promptly leave the venue. 
So um, I'd also like to do a big thank you to Martin and, uh, and Duff TV for doing, us, doing this for us today. So thank you, Martin. Really appreciate it. So who am I? My name's Meg Smith. Um, I'm one of those 17 residents who had the uh, door knocked by WSP on behalf of state growth uh, in uh, March and April this year. Despite what Michael Ferguson would, had you, would have you believe, we were told that houses from 8A to number 42 would be compulsorily acquired for the demolition of the fifth lane bus extension. Uh, I've since been told, just for the record, I've since been told by Michael Ferguson that he would look after me and my house is now no longer and affected, which is good for me, but doesn't do much for my 14 other neighbours. At this point, um, we're not too sure what's happening, but we'll talk about that again a bit later. So look, I found myself accidentally as a spokesperson for a grassroots community uh, campaign. We've called ourselves SOS Hobart 2021. SOS standing for Southern Outlet, Smart, Savvy and Sensible Solutions. We realise that solving traffic congestion is the key and that if we want to save our homes and our community, we need to solve traffic con congestion problems for everybody in Hobart. Um, yeah, so that's who we are. We're also interested in calling the government to account. We want to know what their evidence based what their evidence base is for the fifth lane extension and what low cost, no cost alternatives or indeed any alternatives have been looked at. So um, I'd like to let you know how we've structured today. We have invited a range of state politicians. Uh, the Premier has declined. Elise uh, Archer, Mark Shelton, Jeremy Rockcliffe and um, Roger Gents have all sent their apologies. They are otherwise uh, delayed or unable to attend. Uh, we haven't invited Michael Ferguson because I've met with him twice and frankly I'm sick of talking to him. Um, sometimes you just need to give that up. Uh, look, we've also invited uh, Helen Burnett, Dean Winter, Rebecca White and Janie Finlay and they send their heartfelt apologies and not able to invite us to join us today. We have and we will be joined by some of our uh, supportive politicians who have been really along the road with us on this journey. And they are Ella Haddad. Ella has got a petition up for us, which we'll talk about in a minute. Thank you very much, Ella. And Christy Johnson, who has been pestering Michael Ferguson and uh, the Premier uh, to get some sensible answers on what's happening. But I'd also like to thank Helen Burnett as well and Cassie O'Connor for their support. So the purpose of the today, because we have met with state growth and infrastructure and um, Michael Ferguson, but we don't really think they've taken us seriously. So we're here to present our argument to you, the public, about Ferguson's fifth lane folly, or at least that's what it's called in my kitchen. Uh, we feel like our contribution has not been listened to, and we've got two questions we want you to vote on today. We're doing our own bit of public consultation. We've got a couple of uh, guest speakers who've donated their time to us today. We'd really like to thank them for that. Um, and we're going to have, if we have time, we've got two uh, guest presenters on the floor who are going to give us some summary comments about what they've heard today. Um, and hopefully uh, we'll have two uh, answers for our two questions. So what won't we talk about? We won't talk about the current process and individual stories of affected residents. This is happening now on my street. We're not going to talk about that because it's traumatic, it's upsetting and, frankly, it's been a long seven months and we're sick of it. Um, and I think you need to realise, we all need to realise that there's a significant power imbalance between individual families who are negotiating with a well-resourced and well-connected government department. So we're not going to talk about those <clears throat> individual stories. But I'd like to start today by acknowledging and paying my respects to the Tasmanian Aboriginal community, the traditional owners, original and continuing custodians of this land on which we meet today. And I'd like to share with you a personal story. As a young social worker some <coughs> years ago, uh, I was a probation and parole officer and institutional social worker in a medium to high security men's prison on the mainland. I had a very limited view of what custodian meant had a very negative connotation associated with punishment, power and powerlessness. Then I was fortunate enough to move to Alice Springs and work with some Aboriginal liaison officers from Arunda, Central Desert Women, Morty and Jennifer. And they probably changed my thinking uh, probably forever. Um, and 
probably prompted me to think of custodian as a privileged keeper and a future guardian. And that's probably one of the reasons why, I mean, obviously my house is in the firing line, so that made me angry, but that future custodian concept is the other reason that has really annoyed or angered me about this whole uh, fifth lane expan expansion. Um, so what were we told? We were told that all homes from 8A to 42 would go. We were given a whole heap of inconsistent stories. We were told there was three levels of government support. Liberal, Labor and the Greens were behind it. We were told it would be gone by Christmas and that the cost was anywhere between 50, 15 and 50 million. We are also told that intentionally no low cost, no cost solutions had been looked at. SOS Hobart 2021 considers traffic congestion is a symptom of poor urban planning. Therefore, we need to plan our space. It's important that we plan our space now for us and for future generations that we've never met. Before I hand over to our next speaker, I'd like to just remind you that if you haven't signed our petition, Ella Haddad has sponsored a petition for us in State Parliament. Oh, thank you, Andrew Wilkie, for joining us this afternoon. Andrew and his office have also been huge supporters of us since this begun. So if you haven't signed our petition, please put your hand up here and now. We've got some flyers, we've got a QR code. You can, you can scan and sign right here, right now. So if you haven't signed, put your hand up. If you want to sign, of course, you don't have to sign. Um, and Catherine in the red jumper will come around and Duncan has the uh, code as well. So put your hands up, make sure they see you. So our first speaker is Sophie Underwood. Sophie is the State Coordinator of Planning of the Planning Matters Alliance Tasmania Network, which represents over 60 community groups from across Tasmania. They are national planning champions of 2020 and were named such by the Planning Institute of Australia. They plan for strategic, sustainable and integrated planning for Tasmanians for both now and in the future. Please welcome Sophie. Thank you, Meg, and thank you, SS Hobart 2021, for having the Planning Matters Alliance, also known as PMAT, here today. Uh, personally, my heart goes out to the 17 households in adjoining Dunern community that, that must um, be feeling so much pressure and stress right now. PMAT formed in 2016, and uh, as Meg said, um, we've almost got 70 community groups from across the state. And essentially, we're calling for, amongst other things, a strategic, sustainable, transparent and integrated planning system which will serve to protect the values that make Tasmania such a special place to live and visit. And that's, for example, our unique natural environment, our heritage, our lifestyle and our democracy. And PMAT would love to see a values-based planning system which actually truly serves the community and uh, underpins our health and wellbeing. Essentially, PMAT formed in direct response to the Tasmanian planning scheme, and, uh, and at that time there was no specific group advocating for strategic planning. And uh, it's very easy for the community not to engage in planning uh, because it's complex, it's dry, it essentially has its own language, and uh, often the community don't engage until it's too late. And it's these kinds of issues like the fifth lane or high rise in Hobart or a multi-unit development being um, built next door to you when people tend to engage in planning. Uh, and that by that time it's often too late, but not always. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we exist. We really want the community to engage in planning and strategic planning in particular. And uh, there are two critically important opportunities uh, that the community has now to help shape the future of Hobart and Tasmania. And, um, and one regarding Hobart's future is that every land title uh, is about to be transitioned to the new planning scheme uh, rules under the Tasmanian planning scheme. And the scheme has not been implemented yet in Hobart. Uh, the final step in the implementation of the Tasmanian planning scheme, which is called the Local Provision Schedule, will be advertised by Hobart City Council this year or early next year. And uh, this will be advertised for 60 days. And it's the community's opportunity to have your say, essentially, on Hobart's future. And PMAT has a guide on our website to help communities engage in that process. We launched that at the beginning of last year. So I'd encourage you to jump onto the website and download that free guide and read um, more around why we're concerned about the Tasmanian planning scheme. 
There's also one really important other opportunity that's uh, out for comment right now, and uh, given its importance, we are disappointed really that the Tasmanian government has not really done its job in promoting the fact that the Tasmanian planning policies are actually out for comment until the end of next week. So comments close on those on the uh, 22nd of October at five o'clock, and uh, in, if you have a look at PMAT's website in our news section. Uh, you'll see the relevant links uh, for the community to be able to uh, comment on that. We'll also be sending out an email tomorrow to explain what the Tasmanian planning policies are in the process. Um, so if you're not already, we'd really encourage you to uh, subscribe to receive our emails. Uh, you can do that on our website. And we will also be sending out our submission on Wednesday before 12 midnight. Um, next week uh, if you'd like to see what we've written and that can help inform your uh, submission into this really important process. And it does relate to transport, I promise. So uh, essentially the planning policies are the newest plan part of the planning system and uh, they were developed in 2018 and PMAT actually helped uh, with tri tripartisan support achieve eight amendments to the, that process and we helped improve the transparency by increasing the role of Parliament, the Tasmanian Planning Commission and the community in that process. So it's a really important process to be part of. And uh, although our PMAT's preference has been for state policies, uh, we did welcome um, the development of the Tasmanian planning policies and there is a big difference because state policies are signed off by the parliament and it's a whole of government approach whereas the Tasmanian planning policies, these new policies, are only signed off by the minister and they affect the planning system only. Uh, and essentially why they're important is because they create the intention of the planning system. So if you have a plan, what is it that you're trying to achieve? So this is why these are really important, because it's the policies that provide the intention. And it's always been a founding concern of ours was um, the, the government should have done this policy work, which they said they would before the 2014 state election, um, or leading into the state election, and that they would develop a, a suite of state policies to help inform the development of the Tasmanian planning scheme. Unfortunately, they've done that round the wrong way, uh, but at least this is a step towards strategic planning, and, um, and so we welcome that. Uh, so what is it that, you're, that we've been asked to comment on and why is this so important? And one of those things relates to, for example, transport and infrastructure. So do we want to build more roads, for example, to solve traffic congestion? These are the kinds of questions and issues that we can consider in these policies. But there are other things as well, like social and economic wellbeing, uh, settlements, livable communities, uh, cultural heritage, natural heritage, our, li our lifestyle, uh, hazards, for example, with bushfires. So it covers everything. It will also, they'll also address um, climate change and also our response to COVID. So these are really important policies. And the other thing on the ground, essentially, is that the Tasmanian policies will help shape the future of Tasmania's planning system going forward. So they will shape the regional land use strategies and they will shape the Tasmanian planning scheme. And uh, that's one of the key bits of work that the Tasmanian government will be doing next year is the regional land use strategies, which will have massive implications for our transport networks, um, where we can develop that kind of thing. And it's interesting to note that at the moment, even though that docu those documents are so critically important, that we as the community do not have the opportunity to have public comment on those regional land use strategies. So that's something that we will be working on to try and ensure that that happens. Uh, but fundamentally, and uh, this is what we said on radio actually a few weeks ago, was our biggest fear with this process is that the government won't listen. And we're seeing this with the fifth lane issue, the government not listening to the community. So I guess the bigger question is, how do we change the culture of government to listen to the community? Thank you very much. Wow, a plan. That'd be, that'd be an interesting thing, wouldn't it? <laughs> Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, so what I'd like to do now, uh, before I introduce our second speaker, is to let you know why we think this is a bad idea. At SOS Hobart 2021, we've got some real concerns. The first concern we have is about the cost. At best, we think Michael Ferguson's claim that's gonna cost $35 million in Senate estimates recently is dubious. 
Why do we think that? Because in a community consultation that uh, SOS Hobart 2021 was invited to, WSP told us that it was a really unstable cliff face. We've had quotes that range from 30 million to 72 million. Martin Blake, Infrastructure Tasmania CEO, told us at a, a community forum in April that 35 million would get the job started and then they'd work until they ran out of money. Um, there isn't a concrete plan. We don't know what this is going to look like. There's no final impact on Denern roads. That's still unclear. The geotechnical survey work has not commenced. We don't know the broader impact on those homes in Tolman Hill, Tolman's Hill and those homes in Sandy Bay. There are so many holes to the price tag. Do the costs include the recent TV advertising campaign? Do they include the public consultation process? Do they include the acquisition of homes? Do they include the damage to existing homes or to the remaining homes? I don't know. We can't get a, smart, a, stri a straight answer. And then there's the broader context. I don't know if you've noticed, but every government across the world at this point in time is going to build themselves out of COVID using big infrastructure projects. This drives the cost of those projects up globally. And reports just this week in, uh, in the news have noted that there is a workforce skills shortage for construction workers. That too is going to drive costs up. So how much is this going to cost? Is it going to be 30? Is it 35? Is it 72? Is it 100 million? Is it 200 million? I don't know. I think these are really good questions that we as Tasmanians should be able to ask and get straight answers for, or at least best evidence answers. Um, the other thing we don't know is how long it's going to take. What we do know is it's going to happen overnight. So if you happen to be living in Tolman's Hill, Sandy Bay, Denern, South Hobart possibly, I don't know how, how far and wide you'll hear uh, the road works overnight. What are our other concerns is the opportunity cost. What is lost when we use this money to build this folly? What is not funded in communities, not just in Hobart, but across Tasmania? If the cost blows out, where does this money come from? Does it come from the usual whipping boys? From health, from housing, from community services, from public transport, from regional investment? Especially in the light of recent predicted GST shortfalls. And what do we get? What is the bang we get for our I don't know how much money we're being asked to fork out. Um, we don't know a lot, but what we do know, and this has come from State Growth's own uh, traffic modelling, that the entire extension of the bus lane will save two minutes for the average car journey in a 40-minute window, and three minutes for buses in an average hour window. I don't know what you think, but I think that's a pretty bad return on my dollar. It also is, as a traffic management strategy, it will do nothing for you getting home in the evening. Endless roadworks at night, more congestion in the city, induced demand, more traffic, it just goes on and on and on. One of the other things that have, uh, that have concerned us is the poor public consultation process. It's not been genuine. We've heard from Michael Ferguson in a meeting to say that he, it wasn't a popularity contest um, and he wouldn't really be persuaded to change his view. So what's the point of it then? Why do we all waste time doing that if, if it gets us no voice? There have been many flaws in the public consultation process. I don't know if any of you noticed, my husband doesn't have his own email account. He couldn't, he couldn't do a response because you could only do one response per one email. So if you live in a household where there's more than one adult who doesn't have a, a, an email address, you couldn't contribute. There's been no genuine alternatives presented that we could vote against as part of the consultation process. And conveniently, in the fabulously looking flyover and video and advertising, there's absolutely been no mention of the Denern Road homes. I don't know if anyone else has uh, noticed that, but we're already gone on those maps, uh, which, you know, for us is increasingly distressing. So I want to do the first of our votes at this point, um, and please contribute only if you, or participate only if you feel comfortable. I'm wondering if you can put your hands up, those of you who participated in the recent online state growth public consultation process that closed, I think it was last month. Yep. Can I get you to leave your hand up if you thought that process was a genuine attempt to hear your views about traffic congestion? Well, isn't that interesting? 
another thing they can't do. So, what if the problem isn't the resource, but manufactured demand and the inefficient use of the resources that we have? Well, what I'd like to do now is introduce you to Stephen Burgess, and I'm really excited to hear Stephen speak. Uh, he's an engineer and urban strategist, which just sounds so cool, um, who designs resilient and livable cities. He's also the director of Complete Streets, uh, who are interested in livable and contemporary, contemporary places that we live, and really fits with our view of that custodian uh, discussion that we're trying to, to open up. Stephen's going to talk to us about land use and public transport, and I welcome Stephen today. Thank you. Sophie and I speak together at some gigs and we rarely don't have to adjust the microphone. <laughs> anyway, we'll see how we go. Thanks for inviting me. Um, great to see so many people here. A couple of familiar faces, but some new faces, which is great. Um, yeah, as Meg said, I've got a pretty good job. Some really rich guy in America, up until very recently at least, used to fund me to go all over the world helping cities that are struggling fix their stuff. And then a couple of years ago, I got a call from State Growth and said, can you come home and fix our stuff? Because I was born and bred here. Went to, grew up in Woodbridge and went to, then went to Riverside High School. But I did what people my age did back then in the late 70s, early 80s. When you got to 17, 18, 19, where did you go? Yeah, you went away and I only just got back. But the great thing about Tasman, you've got quite a strong homing beacon, yeah? You always want to come back, and there's some reasons why they're not all coming back, and some of the young ones are still going, is because our city's not quite as grand and as delicious and as beautiful as it probably should be. And the great thing about improving cities is it's really, really easy. The only thing about improving cities is if you want to improve it, you have to change something. And that's the trick, isn't it? And the thing about the fifth lane and all these sorts of little projects, you have what a friend of mine calls a catastrophic loss of altitude as in you get down and start talking about details about project without kind of figuring out, we've got this one piece of the jigsaw and we can't quite get it to fit for whatever reason without saying, look, there's a whole big picture here you've got to consider. Yeah? At the moment, if you move to Hobart, unless you have a car, you're at a disadvantage. Yeah? What a horrible, mean thing to do to people. Yeah? They cost a lot of money, they're inherently unsafe. Pretty much the same as smoking cigarettes. If you do it often enough, regularly enough, it'll get you. You or one of your friends or someone else will get hurt. There's no way around that. Road safety is the greatest oxymoron of all time. It is inherently unsafe. And yet we're making a city, as I, someone told me that I shouldn't say this, up until now, we're making a city that unless you have one, you just can't play with the other children. That's really mean, isn't it? Cities that prosper almost always have hideous traffic congestion. And I don't mean between 7.45 and 7.49 you get stuck on the outlet for eight minutes. I mean that between 6 a.m. and 10.30 a.m., you are just not moving. The upside of that in those cities, and you've all been to them, how do you get about? You look for another way, yeah? And so people fund another way, and people walk. Now, oh, there is an exception to the great cities who don't have hideous con traffic congestion. Who, someone would know, obviously, who it is. Venice, yeah? <laughs> Who's trying to walk around Venice? So that's a traffic congestion for, of a different type, yeah? So movement is a thing. 
There are so many more ways to build a city than putting houses on the edge and then saving up the money to build more roads to try and get all those people to start their job at the same time, to do a different thing, and then crowd back onto those little boxes. There's a great author who's, who's, uh, who wrote a book called Transit, Transit for Everyone, Transit for Everyone. And he had a phrase in there that said, if someone came from outer space, they would say, I found the intelligent life form on this planet. It's these machines, cars, and then all these little weird insects jump on the back of them and just go where they go. That we are, we just go where the cars go. They've ruled our lives, they've ruled our cities. I'm working with about 12 cities in Australasia at the moment who are bucking against this trend and say, by this date, they've all got different dates, they've all got different reasons, by this date, we will have no cars in our town centre. They stink, they smell, we don't like them, they're ugly. We take, they take up our exchange space. And they're not doing this because they've got some greeny, lefty, radical, bloody thing. They're doing it because, with one, you've got cars in your city, you can't make any money. And that is the thing. We all need to make, we want young, opportunities for our young people, we want more people to come and invest here. We don't want all our kids to leave at 17. We want them to stay, to invest, to do something, an exciting new city. The problem the city's got is not the fifth lane. The problem the city's got at the moment is we've got no plan. This should be the best small city in the world. No doubt about that whatsoever. And the way to get a good small city is to do two things. You've got to make it immune to the car problem. Get one, don't get one, doesn't matter. You can still participate fully in society and it's got to be green. Delicious, slow, involved, full of patient people that are enjoying this beautiful place. And they're so easy to build. The two things that don't make it work, and we're, they're a bit of indemnity, and Sophie mentioned it, our planning scheme doesn't allow us to build the thing we want the most, which is small, intimate, involved, delicious villages where you know all your neighbours, you can walk around, do most of your stuff in your local neighbourhood, and you can get on rapid transit to go to a different neighbourhood who might have stuff that you don't have in yours. That delicious human experience of going to your local butcher, baker, candle stick maker and say, oh, good day, Steve. Oh, those snags you like, I got some in. I kept some for you. The thing that's killed that experience for most of Australian cities is the car. Because all the houses are too far away from the shop. They're not all stacked up on top of each other and close to the shop. They're miles and miles away. I've got to get in my car and drive. If I'm driving, someone's got to pay for my road space, which is enormously expensive. Then someone else has got to pay for my parking space, which makes... So who goes to a shopping space and said, I know what I'd fix North Hobart. What we need there is more traffic. Who thinks that? But I know there's some... Oh, hopefully there might be one of them here, saying what Ho North Hobart needs is more car parking. Who's going to stay there and say... Yep, more traffic jams, more smell, more black space, less trees, more yuck. Who wants that? There are two things you can do with your public space in your city. One is allocate it to movement, and the other one is allocate it to exchange. Moving. Cars, bikes, it's all movement. Buses, that's how the city gets around. And every time someone moves, it costs you money. So the only way to get it back is through the exchange space. Not just beer for money and all that sort of stuff, but hugs, warmth, talking, smiles. That exchange space gets people to go to centres to stay for longer. If people stay for longer, they like it, they'll come back more often. If they come back more often, they'll spend more money. That's how centres work. We could so easily, slowly but surely, remap Hobart into a series of the best urban villages in the world, connected by zero carbon, high frequency public transit routes to a delightful, clean, green and safe CBD. Of course, if you don't want that, you don't have to choose it but technically it's easy to do. All you have to do is accept the fact 
that you will have to change some things to get there. Apartment buildings will be slightly higher. Footpaths will be wider, there'll be more street trees, but if you do choose to drive your car, it's going to take you a long time to get anywhere because we've filled all that up space with people who are laughing and smiling and hugging and exchanging and spending money and giving your kids jobs and opportunities. But it's a worthwhile swap. I get why this fifth lane issue is irritating, but you have to take half a step back and say, this is not what we're arguing about. We're arguing about whether Hobart is going to be beautiful, clean, green, slow, delicious, inviting and attract investment for all over the world, going to all these people and saying, did you make this city? Did you really do that stuff? How did you do that? We've got a metro plan coming out soon. And if people aren't flying from all over the world and say, how did you make that beautiful plan that will lead to this beautiful city? If that doesn't happen, they've done it wrong. Don't let them put you in that position. If you want that beautiful city, be a hero and tell somebody. Thanks for listening to me. Well, there we go with the microphone again. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Some really interesting um, perspectives. Um, so, what are our solutions at SOS Hobart 2021? Okay. We think it's not a one-trick pony. We think it's about choice for commuters, whether you choose cars, whether you choose public transports, whether you're going to walk, hoverboard or fly. It's all about choice. We were told we only needed a small change in car usage, 4%. Four people out of every 100 needed to have a different choice to improve traffic flow all the way across the system. We understand that the, pres that the options we're about to present aren't the only options, and we understand that other people have different ideas. What we're saying is we want to put our options to you so that you can tell us whether or not they're any good. We are looking at imminent, urgent threat. We have bulldozers at our gates. We're going to look for low-cost, no-cost solutions that can give us some direct relief between now and Christmas. Uh, so we've got three broad topics. Stretching manufactured demand, reducing that demand, and the better use or most efficient and effective use of the existing resources that we have. Stretching demand. So we have manufactured demand to peak on the southern outlet between 7.30 and 8.15. The good news is that we can manufacture demand any way we like. I work at the Royal Hobart Hospital and I am well known for the comment, it's not the chemical composition of carbon. We really can't change that. We can actually design this system any way we want. So, suggestion one. And this is a suggestion for all people, whether you take public transport or, or drive your car. Staggered work hours. The public service is the largest employer of people in the city of Hobart. Imagine Service Tasmania that starts at 7 in the morning and finishes at 7 in the evening. OK, imagine Service Tasmania that starts at 8 o'clock in the morning and finishes at 6. We can design those staggered work hours which reduce demand on the southern outlet really easily. Second, free off-peak public transport for people. We can reward people for changing their behaviour so that if you don't need to travel in peak hour, you actually get rewarded for not travelling at peak, for peak hour. Reducing demand. What about working from home? If COVID has taught us anything, it's that we're not, it's that letting people work from home doesn't have a disastrous effect on productivity. And that letting people work from home actually has positive benefits to regional communities where people are still living and working. Another idea for reducing demand is to reduce the use that freight or the transport industry has for the road between 7.30 and 8.30. If you think about the time that it takes for trucks to accelerate and how many, when they're at a stationary at a stoplight, how many cars you could get through, if you think about the overall impact that that has on traffic flow through the city on each cycle of traffic lights, and if you think that limiting the, the traffic, the transport industry's use of the southern outlet uh, would make the sky fall. Well, let me tell you, Henny Penny, it won't. Other cities across the globe have adapted, indeed, Perth, 
Sydney, there are lots of examples where the freight industry, the transport industry has adapted to not using the road as the main resource between, in peak hour. We suggested that to Michael Ferguson and he laughed at us. Um, well, he didn't laugh at us, but he, he brushed us off. He brushed us aside. In fact, he told me that... Um, no, I won't say that. Um, um, he did raise the... Michael, Michael Ferguson defended the transport industry's right to use the resource for one hour during peak demand as more important than my, right, my private property rights to live in my home for the next 30 years. What's another way we can reduce demand? We can decentralise our services. Healthcare is the prime example. We have hospital in the home services and community rapid response services that, that allow for patients to be cared for in their own homes, in their own communities. We don't have to drag you up the southern outlet into the Royal Hobart by ambulance every time you need to see a doctor. But those services aren't funded. Why not? Well, because we don't have any money. Not only do we reduce the need for staff, patients and families to drag themselves up the southern outlet and indeed in from Sorrell and every other place, we create jobs in regional economic areas and we reduce demand on the Royal Hobart Hospital and the Tasmanian Ambulance Service. So what about the efficient use of existing resources? Well, technology exists that, inform, that can inform commuters to make better choices about when and how they use their car. We have apps that show you real-time, live traffic information, um, and we have a great YouTube clip on our website that explains and demonstrates a city in the United States that adopted that, where you can look at where and when the, uh, the, the, the peak rush hour is, and you can plan your, your movement around that. There are also examples of technology that are used to assist emergency services manage uh, tra peak hour traffic. Um, I think, you know, in the words of Fox Mulder, the technology is out there. It's already in existence. What else can we use to do to use the efficient resource, the efficient use of the resources that we have? We can do better urban planning. We can do better inner city development that frees up existing house stock, that locates those that need acute services closer to medical resources, and that builds vibrant inner city that's attractive to young people. All this without more cars, we invite you to think of living in Bergen in Norway and not Boston in the States. Think outside what you would normally do. Imagine all those people who would like to, to move out of their existing homes into a nice inner city space, but there just isn't that opportunity to do that. Another example of the efficient use of resources is the world's best practice park and ride. If you're, going to put a world's best, if you're going to put a park and ride services in, at least resource it properly. Otherwise, you set it up to fail. Michael Ferguson's put 120 car parks down in Kingsborough area, and he's talking about moving 1,000 people an hour. I had to do math for him and said, what are you going to do with the other 880, Michael? He said, they're going to kiss. It's the kiss and drop. I said, what? 880 people are going to kiss their kids goodbye and drop them at the... Are you real? Do you... Do any of your kids school runs? I doubt it. Anyway, uh, I don't think that he's designed it to succeed. I think that he's designed it to fail. Um, but there are lots of examples of best practice, beautiful park and ride systems across, um, across the, the globe. We don't, have to, we don't have to design that ourselves. We can borrow the best thinking of other people um, that reduce inner city congestion so that if you drive a car, you've actually got less people on the road that you're driving with. That put less pressure on parking because you can actually park in a space when you get into town. They increase regional economic development opportunities and reduce accidents on roads. This morning, you'll be interested to know, there were 49 buses between 7.30 and 8.30, uh, seven in just over a minute and then another 15 minutes before we've seen another bus come along. See, we can see the southern outlet. We know exactly what's going on. There are also 51 large trucks in that time as well. So do the maths on that, see how much time that takes up. The last efficient resource option that we have to suggest is integrated transport. As a part of an, a citywide transport issue, you can get a car broken down on the on the uh, bridge, and the southern outlet will be backed up half the way to King, half the way to Kingston. 
So this is an interconnected organism that needs to, you need to look at all aspects of it. Better Ferry, Northern Rail Corridor, or whatever you draw up, whatever you use out there, all have an impact on southern outlet traffic. Giving people choices across Hobart and making sure that tr public transport meets all people's needs is something that is imperative. We know that people that, that existing bus corridor isn't used to its uh, fullest capacity. So I don't know why putting an extra lane on is going to make it any more attractive. If the bus doesn't pick you up from where you, want, where you are or take you to where you want to go, how does another lane help? Um, how does the fifth lane extension do that if the, re if the resource already exists? So there are, uh, there are our suggestions and we'd like to do our second vote of the day, if that's okay with you. We'd like to ask you, uh, do you think these ideas are worth presenting to State Growth, Michael Ferguson and Infrastructure Tasmania? Do you think they're worth pursuing uh, before they lo we lose our homes? So if you do think that's a good, that some of these are a good idea or you think that they could pursue them uh, more or put some more thought into them, can you put your hand up? Okay, can you put your hand down? Does anybody here not think it's a good idea? Well, thanks, Bob. Um, and look, that's totally fine. As we said at the beginning, we're, we don't have the answers. We have some ideas. But um, I do think that's really interesting. So you think this can't be done? Well, I'm here to introduce you to our third speaker, Jerry White. Jerry's a public officer for the Circular Economy Hewan and are currently designing an integrated transport plan with the Hewan Valley Council. And Jerry's here to talk to us about the Bendigo Integrated, integrated Transport Plan. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, well done, Meg, for organising the event. Terrific. Um, we've been exploring integrated transport for the Huon Valley, and we've come across a number of case studies. And the one that I want to talk you through today, I think, is particularly relevant for where we're at in, in terms of the Southern Outlet. It's about Bendigo and a, the, what they developed, which was called the Integrated Transport and Land Use Planning. Um, in the early 2000s, the population of Bendigo was growing, uh, and, and so they started thinking, well, what's going to happen in terms of congestion, and when is it going to reach maximum capacity? So Vic Roads got together with the council, and they proposed the Bendigo Road Transport Strategy. What is, uh, and, and that was about the extensive and expensive road capacity to tackle peak hour congestion. Does that sound familiar? Um, to reduce delays and improve safety. But it was interesting that through a comprehensive campaign, the Bendigo community rejected the, the, the idea of more roads and wider roads. Uh, and their view was an alternative one, that what was important was that they needed instead to consider things like lifestyle health. Um, they also need to look at, well, what are the climate change impacts of having more, more vehicles because of wider roads? And also about running costs, uh, particularly for families. And so stemming from that, the council said, this is important that we listen to people. And they set up a consultation process that was most impressive. And they went through the usual things, such as surveys. They had storytelling campaigns, and they were published. Public forums, information sessions, workshops, people put in submissions. They had a children's art competition, and they used social media extensively. And as a result of that, they, they decided that they would be able to move uh, and put together an integrated transport plan. And the, the mayor, Peter Cox, the mayor of, of Bendigo, said, the community involvement, engagement and support for a strategy of this type are unprecedented. So it was a community activity and the community response to the consultation that got this moving. The council decided that what was important, that it was a collaborative process of putting together an alternative plan of transport, and it needed to be transparent. These are good words. It was about building community trust. 
uh, and gaining the support of key stakeholders uh, and also the broader community. And they did this in a number of, re I think, really interesting ways. They established a partnership with over 20 businesses and, and uh, non-government agencies to bring together to work on transport. As you would expect, quite a lot of these uh, firms were directly involved in transport, but it was broader than that. So it included um, banks, as you would expect, the Bendigo Bank, um, and, and also universities, health providers, churches, and also the business council within Bendigo. So this is quite inspirational stuff. They also, of course, realised the importance of working with government, uh, and they worked with the council, and they also worked with state government departments and agencies. And by 2012, a couple of years after they started that, they had a figure of something like 90% of people fully supported the vision for a sustainable trans transport strategy and an integrated transport strategy within Bendigo. Amongst other things, and we've talked about health and, and climate change and, and uh, cost, they realised that by adopting that different approach, that they would be spending the taxpayer dollars far more wisely. That they could stretch the budget um, and they could avoid the, the excessive expense on new roads and they could redirect that to, to, to things like maybe housing was needed, maybe more money needs to be spent on, on, on health type issues. Okay, what about the governance? And I find this sort of so obvious, but it, it was clearly written within the, uh, within the document that an integrated transport system needs an integrated governance. It's more complicated, but it was accepting that you need to change the way that you deal with things and manage them and govern. And they did this through uh, establishing a number of different groups. At different times in the project, initially they have one set of gr groups and that's morphed over time. But they've talked about um, steering committees and delivery agents group and implementation groups and reference groups and specific purposes for specific things. And what I find interesting is that government was not just state government and council, which is important, but it included business. It included state agencies, it included people working in health and education, getting schools uh, um, aware of the need for a different transport system is extremely important. Community organisations and community members. There's a great diversity there in terms of the governance. So what, what's happening? Um, a lot has happened and it's still, it's still happening. And because of the way that they consulted widely and they established partnerships, they were able to make sure that people came up with solutions that were acceptable to groups. And they, they did this looking at, I mean, they, had a, they have a rail system, which we don't, but we have other things that they don't have. Uh, we have a great waterway. And they looked at, at, at uh, looking at the bus services, looking at the road systems. This is not to reject road systems, but say, how can we use it as widely as possible, as wisely as possible? Um, active transport also, very important, for getting to hubs to work with public transport, community transport, and carpooling. Um, and so there's a number of specific things that they've come up with, and, and we haven't got time to go through that today. But they were looking both for what's, what's needed now and what's needed over the next 25, 30 years. And it's about bringing about cultural and behavioural change in people. We need to change, and sometimes that can be difficult. D difficult. Um, one of the, 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 there are three examples of change I like the thought that they, the council decided that it was important that their people were using other forms of transport. And so they established a bike fleet for the council so that the people that were having meetings elsewhere in Bendigo could use push bikes and, and presumably e-bikes as well to get out instead of just using cars. Um, with 
a number of employers, because of the partnership that I talked about, they were able to talk to them about a, a, what they called a one in five um, system. That one day out of five every week, people wouldn't bring their cars to work. Now that doesn't sound a lot, but that's a reduction of 20% when you think about it. And that has an impact where, where you've got 19,000 uh, movements on the sun that at a day. If you reduce that by 20%, um, you bring it down to what? 15, 16,000? Could, could easily solve the problem. Um, so that was one of the things that they did. The other thing that they have done is to say, we've got an integrated transport strategy um, that any new developments, any new subdivisions need to be consistent with the transport that we're recommending. And they're in the position to make sure that that happens. Um, there are a stack of specific targets and actions that are being progressively tackled. Uh, and I spoke to the, the lady who has responsibility in Bendigo this morning about the transport strategy and the council is again moving to the next stage of the implementation, which is exciting after 10, 11 years that this is progressing well. So the future looks to be assured. And so my question is this, that if Victoria can manage what I see as a fairly inspirational change of transport, how much better can we do it in Tasmania? Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Um, look, I think, I think the key messages, and I know I promised you all we'll be out of here at 2.15, as I said, I work at the Royal Hobart Hospital. I'm used to herding cats. I will have you out of here at 2.15. Um, so I think the thing to remember is it, it, it's all about choice. It's not a one-trick pony. It might be a road. It might be public transport. It might be walking. It might be better urban planning. It is about a plan, and it is about us all be getting involved with what that plan is. So you might think, what, what have we tried? Um, well, this has been something we've been doing for seven months. We've met with uh, Michael Ferguson twice. Uh, we've met with Elise Archer. Um, who else have we met with, Tony? We've met with a plethora of politicians. The Premier, unfortunately, hasn't met with us. Um, and neither has Madeleine Ogilvie, our, uh, one of our members for Clark. I noticed Mike Dutter out in the audience as well. Mike's been another one of our supporters, which has been hugely appreciative. Um, what do we take from this? I think as a community of, of residents on Denern Road, we take that um, indeed we're not actually alone in this because for a while it did feel like it was just us and we were um, expendable. So I'd like to thank you all for coming and just reminding us that we're actually part of the community and we're valuable and, and you appreciate us. So that's been hugely, um, uh, it means a lot, I tell you. Um, I'd like for you, if you, if you could, I'd like to, for you to sign our web, to sign our petition. If you haven't, if if you've signed it, get somebody else to sign it. Um, it's open until the 17th of November, and it's one way that we can clearly demonstrate to those in power that people don't agree with this. Stop it! Stop it! Um, stop it! Uh, we'd like you to feel free to ring your politicians. Um, and let them know you think this is a stupid idea and a fat waste of money. Uh, they're going to tie us up to this for, I don't know how long this is going to cost us or how long we will be paying for this. And that's, that's what really concerns, really frightens me. Sign the petition, contact your politicians if you would like to connect with us as a group. We've got a website. It's called, strangely, SOS Hobart 2021. Um, Actually, it's not. It's called soshobart.org. Uh, please do uh, get involved. We think traffic congestion is a symptom of poor urban planning. Um, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to thank our guests. I'd just like to point out as well, we were giggling up here. You might have seen us. Um, Steve was one of the original authors of the Bendigo <laughs> Integrated Transport Plan. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> 
So not only do we know about this, but we also have somebody here as a resource and a knowledge base that can help us do it. Um, do know that we're exhausted up on the hill um, and you know we've had a lot of wine drunk. Um, but anyway, well, that's a conversation for somebody else. Uh, we need to consider the opportunity cost of the choices that we've made and we need to build a better future, not just for our transport needs, but for those in the future. I have also two other speakers that I'd ask John Livingston, who's a former senior lecturer in commercial law at UTAS, uh, editor Transport Laws of Australia and fellow of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. Tony Dell, are you ready with the microphone? Um, I'd just like, uh, John, if you could stand up and give a really quick, uh, just a, a comment about what you think, because we have only a very few minutes. Um, so thank you, John, um, for, for doing that. Okay. You can you just just where you are, John. That would be good. I, I should really forego this and let you ask questions, but we're pretty well right on the money. May I say again, if you're interested in listening to the, the comments, Bob and I agree on one thing. We think that the proposal for the fifth layer outset, uh, um, outlet is in fact a great waste of money. Helen Burnett, Deputy. Yeah, we've already said so. Mike, well, I did ask. No, you can go. Post to your mouth. Post to the person. It needs to go up to the I love technology. It always bites me on the bum. Now, Bob, Bob and I both agree on this. We, we don't agree on a number of things, but that's all part of the fun. What I do find is that the consultation with the people involved in it has been abysmal. I, I know Mark and Blake, we, we've done a lot of work between us, not recently, and uh, he's shown me how, in fact, all the traffic movements in uh, the whole of Tasmania are monitored. The answer, I think, is probably in an article I wrote in the, the Mercury about the alternatives. If I was to channel Green Hitting, in 2018, I'd find that these were his proposals. Investment in a new CBD transit hub, provision of infrastructure facilities for a new ferry service, activate the northern suburbs rail, corridor for passenger transport, David Macquarie Street, a transit priority measures, we're only just seeing that, and priority on key northern and southern arterial corridors for passenger transport. Thanks, now, John. Thanks, John. That's it. Sorry. That's it. We really right. are going to move you through. Um, well, I don't think we're going to get to you at all. Um, what we might do, Bob, is see if we can get you taped afterwards, perhaps, and put you up on the um, on the website. Thank you, Martin. So Bob, uh, Bob's a former lecturer at UTAS School of Geography and Environmental Studies, is a Master of Transport Economics, and is particularly interested in changing societal travel patterns, particularly as fe female work workforce participation has increased. I know Bob will have a different view, and it's important that we listen to all the views. Um, I have a Master's of Economic and Regional Development, for what it's worth, um, and I also teach health economics at the University of Tasmania. The opportunity cost of what we're about to be fostered, foisted onto us is absolutely makes me want to scream or drink wine. Anyway, just as like you would in the movies, it is now 2.15. I'd like to do the thank yous. Think of them as the credits. Please move out of the room as I read out the thank yous. Thank you very much for coming. Don't forget to ring your politicians. Thank you to Sarah Carson from the Hobart City Council who pulled this together for us really quickly. Thank you to Helen Burnett for her support, Ella Haddad for her petition, Christy for her support and parliamentary questions, Andrew Wilkie for his parliamentary questions and support, Mike Dutter for the use of his, uh, of his cafe and his ongoing support, Cassie O'Connor for the payment of the uh, hall, Vicar Bailey for his support in helping us get it together. Big round of applause for Martin Duffy, who uh, helped, who's, who's live streamed this. If you get a chance, have a listen to David Minchin from the Giant Hamsters, stuck in the middle with you, uh, a, 
a bastardised version of Steelers Wheel Classics. I'd like to thank the guest speakers for all of their time, to Steve Burgess, Jerry White and Sophie Underwood. I'd like to thank you for coming. I'd like to thank the community of Denern Road. I'd like to thank all those people who letterboxed. We delivered 5,000 pamphlets. I'd like to thank all our supporters. Um, and I'd like to thank oh, yeah, David Minchin, because everybody needs a good protest song. And mostly, and special thanks, to Michael Ferguson for uniting our community and reminding us of our custodian responsibilities to the city of Hobart. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.